Good afternoon and welcome to this virtual panel on the prospects for the tourism industry after the COVID-19 pandemic. I am Annalisa Vertagella, I am a research fellow at ISPI and the scientific coordinator of the Roma Dialogues. And I will only take one minute today um, for thanking the King Faisal Center for uh, Research and Islamic Studies, the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and of course the Italian Embassy in Riyadh especially Ambassador Cantone, Cantone for having helped us in organizing today's discussion, uh, which is part of a broader effort to keep uh, the MED dialogues and the uh, dialogue in itself, I would say, alive even in, in, uh, in these very strange times. Uh, the topic of today's discussion is particularly important because uh, travel and tourism, uh, besides of course having an important economic dimension, they are really what allow people to meet and to know each other. Uh, so I would say to overcome distance and uh, to reduce barriers. And this again, overcoming distance and reducing barriers is what we try to do with uh, the MED Dialogues, uh, which uh, this year will be held in a hybrid format, mostly online of course, from the 25th of November to the 4th of December. So I invite you to join us on those days for keeping the dialogue and the conversation alive. And uh, I will now leave the floor to Mr. Alufi from the King Faisal Center, who will chair today's discussion. Please, Mr. Alufi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, in this webinar on tourism in Europe and the Gulf uh, under and after uh, the COVID pandemic. And for months, for months now, we've been living in new reality realities of uh, COVID-19, disrupted li life experiences and livelihood. Uh, the health crisis uh, has brought with it a shadowing economic crisis, perhaps no sector uh, in the global economy was more affected than, than tourism. Um, the sector momentarily brought to an almost a complete halt from aviation, hosp hospitality, entertainment, um, so either people stop traveling uh, or because of uh, public health measures uh, uh, introduced by governments, uh, international tourist, um, uh, tourist arrivals witnessed a decline by 58% uh, to 78% uh, expected this year. So in this webinar, what we'll do, we'll take a closer look on tourism in two regions, Europe, or more specifically Italy, where the industries will establish contributing close to 15% uh, to the GDP and uh, the Gulf, or more specifically Saudi Arabia, which recently unveiled uh, ambitious plans uh, to revamp and diversify the sector that used to be uh, limited to religious tourism. So given the importance of, of tourism uh, in the national policies in, in, in these two economies, um, so we'll ask questions about um, how, about the magnitude of, of the, the impact of COVID on, on the sector, what are the challenges and the prospects, and finally, whether uh, and or what are the, the grounds for co cooperation between the two regions oh, in, in this regard. Uh, we are actually privileged today to, to have to get insights from uh, a distinguished, uh, distinguished panelist. Um, we are honored to, to have with us uh, uh, His Excellency Roberto uh, Cantoni, the ambassador of Italy in, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We also have uh, Hamad al uh, the D Director General of the Investment Department at the Ministry of Tourism in Saudi Arabia. Uh, also, Basmal Meiman, the Director of uh, Regional uh, Department for the Middle East in, in the United Nations World Tourism Organization. Uh, we'll have also uh, Ors uh, Bengili, Senior uh, Knowledge Expert uh, at McKinsey and Company Switzerland. Uh, and also we have Christina uh, Mutterini, uh, Director of Masters 
program in, in economics and tourism in Bakun University, uh, Italy. And last but not least, uh, uh, Dr. Karen Young, uh, resident scholar at the American Enterprise uh, in Institute in the United States of America. Uh, so we'll, we'll, the format of, of the webinar will be uh, an open conversation. So I, I will uh, pose some questions to the, the panelists and, and the, the conversation will flow from there. So uh, for, in the beginning, we, uh, let's, ask the, the, let's see the, bigger, the big picture or have an overview of uh, how um, COVID-19 impacted um, or, or still actually uh, affecting uh, tourism industry in the Mediterranean region uh, and the Gulf. So maybe we could we can um, um, pose this question to Miss um, uh, uh, Almiman um, from from the uh, UN uh, TWO. Uh, it's your mute. Uh. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, well, as you know, that the tourism uh, sector is a major source uh, of employment and government uh, revenue and foreign exchange. And um, uh, European uh, tourism accounts for half of the world's uh, tourism um, uh, arrivals. Europe was um, still is the second uh, most uh, hit region uh, in the world after Asia. Uh, Middle East um, is the third region um, as well. Um, Europe suffered a, uh, a loss of um, 213 million international arrivals through June compared to the same period uh, in 2019. Um, the international tourist arrivals in Europe, uh, most visited destinations were down to 66% in the first half of 2020 over the same uh, period last year with a drop of 97% in the second uh, quarter. So uh, widespread uh, travel restrictions and lockdowns and nearly all uh, tourism destinations during the second half of March and the months of April and May weighed heavily on the results of the first uh, and uh, second half. Um, as for the Middle East region, most of the destinations, um, actually all of the destinations were closed. Most of them are, uh, are still closed. 57% uh, we witnessed a 57% uh, uh, decrease in the, for the period between January and, and June, and there was a loss of 19, um, um, rather 19 um, uh, million uh, international uh, tourism arrivals uh, decreased compared to the same period uh, of 2019. Uh, major destinations, um, in the region, such as uh, Egypt and, and Saudi Arabia, restart, uh, restarted um, tourism. Egypt has resumed uh, international flights uh, in, Jan in, in uh, July 1st after three months of uh, complete uh, suspension, while the campaign of um, domestic tourism um, in, in, in Saudi Arabia, Saudi summer, was launched to stimulate domestic tourism in Saudi Arabia. However, um, mo again, um, uh, most of the destinations uh, in the region are closed. So um, if we speak of air travel and accommodation indicators, um, the Middle East hotel occupancy fell by almost 42% to 35 percent in July and uh, for, uh, speaking of revenue per available room, there was a drop of 47 percent. So uh, despite month over month improvements in the Middle East, um, the region saw its lowest absolute occupancy and revenue per available room levels um, 
until um, until um, July and um, also in terms of uh, airlines uh, Middle Eastern Airlines uh, uh, posted an, an, a 93% uh, traffic uh, decline in July compa compared with uh, 96% uh, demand drop in, in June. Um, so, and also load factor dropped uh, to 38%. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Um So I just uh, want to uh, emphasize that uh, we will have a Q&A session. So please, if you have any questions or comments, uh, uh, you can share it uh, in, in the Q&A function here in, in Zoom. Um, so this is an, over an overview. Let's, let's take a closer look maybe now on, on um, the impact uh, in Europe. Uh, and how the tourism industry is faring uh, in Europe uh, under COVID-19. And maybe we, we can give us an idea about that. Um, Ms. Uh, uh, Mutironi, Mutironi, please. Yeah, um, well, I think that uh, if we want to consider the effects of the pandemic in Europe, um, we should distinguish two aspects that are both relevant. From one side, obviously, we have the effects on the, on the tourism uh, European economy, but on the other side, we have also the effects on uh, the expectations and motivations of uh, tourism demand. If we consider Europe, um, as, as uh, uh, Ms. Maimal said, uh, it is the first region for international arrivals in the world. And uh, this also implies the fact that the contribution to GDP of tourism is very relevant. Um, tourism contributes to 10% of direct and indirect uh, GDP in Europe and 12% uh, of employment. This means that 23 million jobs, direct and indirect jobs, depends on tourism. Uh, for some countries, especially Mediterranean countries, Southern Europe countries, this, uh, this relevance is even higher. Um, so if we consider Greece, if we consider Portugal, if we consider Spain, Italy itself, and so forth, the relevance of this sector is even higher. Um, this means that the impact of the pandemic has been devastating um, because uh, Obviously, uh, the, the, this uh, dependence on international arrivals have had uh, quite an effect. Uh, estimates say that uh, we lost uh, around 60, 70 percent of international arrivals, and uh, this loss uh, is even more uh, relevant and sizable if we consider revenues, uh, because we are around 85 percent loss in revenues. Uh, for some sectors such as transports, the loss is estimated to be higher. A loss which is uneven also because after the lockdown and during the summer season, uh, we have had destinations that uh, have invested a lot in domestic tourism and domestic demand um, in neighborhood countries. So obviously this has helped. To, to reduce the effects of the, uh, of the lockdown. But if we consider, for instance, Italy, in Italy, uh, just 60% of uh, Italians traveled over the summer season. They mostly traveled in Italy. So this helped the sector to be uh, sustained uh, over, over the summer season. But obviously, this cannot fully compensate the loss in international demand. Um, on the other side, the other important aspect is that also demand expectations are changing. And this is an aspect we need to consider, especially for the recovery phase, uh, because the tourism demand um, from one side, obviously, um, has in the, in the short term, has decided to shift towards domestic or close destination traveling um, has um, had higher uh, standards, has required 
higher standards in terms of uh, safety, in terms of uh, health uh, protocols and uh, so forth. Uh, but most of all, tourism demand is showing um, a growing interest in uh, activity-based uh, uh, tourism, in uh, tourism activities which are not uh, in uh, overcrowded spaces or in overcrowded destinations, a higher sensitivity for sustainable issues, for environmental issues. So I think that besides the economic impact, which is severe, uh, a very important aspect we should consider is that all the monitors in Europe are highlighting these changes in tourism demand, which is uh, relevant as well. Thank you very much. So let's move now to, to Saudi Arabia, taking this question, the, the, the interesting point uh, of, of the, the change in the nature of the, the demand and, and the demand expectation. Um, so, Mr. Bluey, if you can, if you can tell us more about uh, what are the tourism-related sectors more affected, most affected in Saudi Arabia, and whether you see similar or different uh, dynamics uh, in terms of the, how how the demand is, is changing and the expectations. Thank you, thank you, Ahmed. Uh, good afternoon to everyone on the call, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, colleagues on the panel, um, you know, COVID-19 uh, didn't take uh, uh, or didn't leave anyone uh, to not to suffer from the impact that it's had. Uh, as the UN WTO figures have shown, uh, this has really paralyzed the sector globally. Um, the kingdom has dealt with it in different ways. We were one of the first countries to have uh, introduced the travel restrictions. Which, a, which then eventually enabled us to contain the spread of the virus in a much better way than we have seen in other countries. We uh, identified the different phases that we needed to do to help the, recover, the recovery of the sector. Uh, uh, first, introducing, of course, as you mentioned, the travel restrictions, uh, uh, prioritizing the welfare of citizens, by uh, creating a repatriation program that enabled 60,000 Saudis to come back to the kingdom, quarantine in the hospitality uh, elements, free testing for all, healthcare for all. And all these measures were uh, uh, really uh, uh, to mitigate the impact that it would have on the economy. Um, I mentioned the repatriation program, 60,000 Saudis came back and had to quarantine for 14 days. And, and I, I think this was uh, another vindication of the great uh, uh, foresight that our government has in dealing with such uh, uh, issues. They actually provided uh, the hospitality uh, uh, establishments, the hotels, with the ability to host these 60,000 people. And what that did is opened up revenue streams for, the ho for these hotels who would otherwise be idle. Uh, this cost the government a lot of money, but we knew that this kind of support at a time where little to no business would have happened for the hospitality is needed to help, to the, to help uh, uh, enable the hospitality to sector to quickly recover when we start uh, assuming and attracting tourists to come to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So that answers the first part of your question is what subsectors have we uh, managed to enable? Uh, compliance, social distancing norms, uh, 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 strict precautionary measures were introduced to make sure that we, by June 24 of 2020, were able to launch a domestic tourism campaign to tell Saudis residents and citizens alike to go and, and, and discover the different value proposition and beautiful nature and offering this kingdom has to offer. Uh, and by that date, we launched a program called Tenefes, which translates into Breathe. And that notion was to tell everybody through being compliant to the safety uh, and precautionary measures, we can still enjoy tourism in, in, in maybe different ways than we were used to in the beginning. A series of initiatives were launched to make sure that the private sector were able to uh, uh, mitigate the risk and the economic impact of COVID-19. These included deferrals of tax payments, exemptions from licensing fees, and even grants given to salaries of Saudis uh, uh, to help uh, them overcome that difficult area. Through those uh, initiatives, cash flow strains were less on the private sector, 
uh, uh, and uh, uh, the private sector was being able or were able to recover quickly to be able to absorb the amazing demand that happened through the domestic tourism campaign. Uh, it's very important and, 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 and actually uh, uh, eye-opening to see that the latest figures we have on the domestic tourism campaign show that 35% of offering that was created in the summer campaign was new investment. And that is considerable when we are collectively talking about a time that was unprecedented and never seen before. Occupancy rates are above 50%, and that's an average across the kingdom. Again, at a time where it is uh, labeled a crisis, that is a significant number. Uh, uh, the ADR is, of course, at, at levels that are, uh, 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 we are consistent with year on year. We are not seeing a decrease on those numbers. And again, these are also uh, indica indicators that the kingdom, through just opening up its doors for the domestic market and not even opening up its doors for international market until the turn of the year is uh, and will be a top tourism destination and our ambition by 2030 remains intact. Uh, in terms of the impact uh, through the earlier time of, of COVID-19, we were not any different to other markets. Uh, if you look at uh, July year on year, we went down from uh, uh, 7.1 a million passengers coming into the kingdom to only 1 million uh, uh, passengers, a drop of 85%. If you look at uh, the occupancy rates year on year, it went down from 68% to 24% in July. And this was again at the start of the uh, domestic tourism campaign and a pickup there. Uh, and if you look at the visitation numbers, a drop of 96% year on year in July. And again, these are all reflecting numbers before the domestic tourism campaign. Since we launched this amazing campaign, uh, which is actually the first product of a newly established tourism board in the kingdom, the Saudi Tourism Authority, with its work to promote tourism and to develop destinations across the kingdom, this is a brilliant site of success uh, and, a, and, a, and a great start for us in our ambitions in tourism. I will not take too much of your time, but I, I want to also uh, uh, use this time to say, not only were we able to recover, we were even able to do firsts in the kingdom. And I'm sure as you have been following the kingdom and its great uh, 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 achievements over the last four or five years, uh, uh, being the best, being uh, uh, proactive, uh, creating firsts is uh, 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 not uh, too different than what we are used to in the last five or six years. Uh, the cruise liner, the Silver Sea Spirit, has seen a beautiful uh, uh, first cruise ship on the Red Sea in the kingdom that opened up almost uh, four or five weeks ago, uncovering the true treasures of the Red Sea. And I'm sure Ambassador uh, Katroni can speak to that if he has visited the beautiful Red Sea. And uh, we are very optimistic about the recovery of our sector. And we are very ambitious when it comes to developing tourism in Saudi Arabia. So I hope that answers your question, Ahmed. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Abloui. Um, so we see, we see here some similarities, specifically uh, this shift to for, to um, domestic tourism, um, as as we have you know, um, seen in, in, in Europe and now in, in Saudi Arabia. It seems that there is a there is a pattern. So um, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Bengili about uh, the recovery and how uh, how how you think the the recovery will will look like, especially with with what you have heard, and what measures can be implemented uh, for the reform of the uh, travel industry in the post pandemic environment, and 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 within that, um, to what extent this uh, change in demand expectation. Uh, will be a long term or something that temporarily to deal with um, uh, during and shortly after the, the pandemic. Mr. Mingiri? Uh, it's, it's muted. Thank you very much, Ahmed, for, uh, for the introduction. Um, I, I'm wondering, you know, should I, should I provide an insight as a realistic optimist or as a optimistic realist. I think we, we've heard quite a few things now which, which at least uh, I think provide a glimpses of hope. 
And I'm actually uh, more towards the glimpses of hope uh, than, um, than uh, actually uh, bringing tourism uh, into, into a graveyard. So um, I hope I can finish your, your very ambitious question in five minutes, actually. Um, I think generally, and building up on what I just said, I think the, the, the prospects are good. And why do I think they are good? <clears throat> First point, travel uh, will come back and has already come back to some extent because I think it's, it has become part of our routine and I would even say it has become part of our DNA as, as human beings. Being able to travel, uh, you know, travel freedom as it says. Um, and uh, a, a good analogy for me is always kind of, you know, 9-11, 2001. 9-11 created a, a totally new complexity and, and inconvenience and certainly also fear uh, around air travel. And a couple of years later with all the um, installed security measures on, on flights and airports and travel and so on, we went back to record levels. So we, we adjusted, we coped with, with the uh, measures uh, implemented and we were able to basically um, you know, travel as we wanted to travel. So we are able to, to jump over hurdles. And I think, you know, the, the, the recent history has shown that as well. Third, travelers are by default relatively opportunistic and willing to take a certain degree of risks if they are fine with the general circumstances. And I think the best analysis I have seen so far, and that builds up on, on what my colleagues have, have said, was um, we, we made initial analysis on the European summer, particularly the central European piece. And uh, similar to what you said before, domestic kind of, you know, was very strong. And the results of June, July, no, sorry, of July and August, 2020. So the two months combined in the markets of Germany, Switzerland and Austria reported drops of minus 14, to 23% overall. So net of all the loss of incoming uh, tourists and the domestic market and particularly also uh, the short distance international market almost recovered the, the, the loss which occurred in urban uh, and international inbound travel by, by, by plane. So uh, minus 14 is digestible as we heard earlier that's digestible and you can basically become, uh, you know, cash, cash positive as, a, as an industry, uh, which I think is very important overall. Um, uh, when does it come back and how? I think uh, we need to differentiate the ge geography and the segments. I'm sure you would agree with that. On the global level, uh, our projections for the 10 largest markets um, in terms of accumulative loss range from 5 trillion to 10 trillion US dollars over the course of the next four years. And the cumulative loss basically means um, what do we lose in the next four years versus the 2019 level? So it's a massive loss still uh, and a lot to be recovering. Uh, however, uh, as we said, domestic starts earlier, certain markets start earlier. Uh, we heard great stories from Saudi Arabia. We are hearing great stories from China where the domestic level uh, is almost at 2019 levels. Um, so uh, that traffic uh, is relatively solid. However, we have two extremes. We have uh, nations within the top 10 uh, economies which are uh, uh, rebounding to 2019 levels probably within 23, 24, and others might take 25, 26, depending on, on the, uh, the pre-COVID situation and also on the on the, uh, the way they handled. And I think overall what we're seeing, which is an, an interesting uh, finding from the Ipsos report is that uh, travelers do combine their perception how individual markets have handled the crisis and actually built in their, their, travel, uh, their travel plans. So we have a couple of markets like, like New, uh, New Zealand, Canada, Germany, Switzerland, um, who are considered kind of, you know, the next countries to travel to simply on the basis of how they managed 
um, you know, the crisis. So quite a few interesting insights there, which very much talks about the psychology of travel and less about the physical element of travel. And not to forget the segment approach, uh, we discussed, you know, um, how, how, to, how to basically project uh, segment specific growth and rebound. And I'm sure you would agree that business travel uh, uh, is, is severely affected, like the mice industry is severely affected. And we do see a structural, um, a structural supply change on the hospitality side as well, so that we have less capacity on hospitality, we have less capacity on, on air travel, which ultimately uh, you know, lifts up uh, rates, which ultimately uh, presents uh, uh, a curfew to, uh, to, to uh, demand. So uh, positive and negative elements, but we truly believe that travel will, will come back within a foreseeable time. Now measures, uh, try to make it short, uh, quite a few things, uh, and over tourism was mentioned by my Italian colleague. I think smart tourism concepts overall are to be implemented on the basis of the learnings from pre COVID as well as on the basis of the learnings from COVID uh, related uh, issues which we need to deal with. And um, that certainly tackles the over tourism part, the experiential part, as well as behavioral changes. We do seek more privacy right now. And I'm, I'm truly wondering how this will actually develop when, when uh, the vaccination is there and people can travel freely again. But uh, smart tourism concept, including all the elements are certainly uh, uh, in need. And that includes the digital support, that includes communication, credibility, trust and loyalty uh, elements, which are super, super important these days because they build the backbone of our travelers' decisions and uh, our findings in, in the summer were spot on, which is people traveled to familiar places, people traveled to familiar hotels, people traveled with a familiar transportation mode. And I think that whole element, how you actually convey the message here is, uh, as, a, as a stakeholder, is super important. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Uh, there's so much uh, really, I mean, to cover and uh, process. Uh, and I realize that uh, we, we have a, a limited time, but I hope we can cover like a, a good uh, overview of, uh, of the state of the sector. So uh, now let's move to to the role of governments in uh, in in in, in this uh, crisis that the sector is going through. Um, and in the general, like national uh, policy, and how 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 does it fit? Uh, so, Dr. Yang, um, if if I would like, if, if I would ask about um, how uh, how could government in, in the Middle East and, and Europe rethink their role in in tourism sector in the context of COVID nineteen? Um, more specifically, if if we would specify it to uh, to put more focus on, on the Gulf in, in this regard, uh, what does it mean for government for for the government's drive toward diversification? Because um, um, governments in the Gulf uh, are trying to to push for ambitious plans um, to to develop the sector as an alternative to to the oil dependent economy or the diversifying away from from oil. Um, so with this crisis, how, how do you see uh, the stress that the tourism industry is under globally would affect uh, that context? Sure. Well, thank you, Ahmed, and thank you to the, uh, the other panelists um, and to Med Dialogue for, uh, for inviting me. Um, I won't speak too much to Europe because I really focus my work on, uh, on the Gulf and the MENA region in particular. Um, but the advice that we're hearing from uh, international financial institutions and, uh, and government bodies is that this is a wonderful time for investment in infrastructure. Um, and so that as a stimulus to react and to try to kind of counterbalance some of the effects of COVID, I think is, um, is the right policy tool. And that's something, of course, that's a little bit more challenging now um, across the oil exporters of the Gulf, 
Um, but it's maybe also a, a, an opportune moment, and maybe this is one of the silver linings, particularly um, for this, the tourism industry in Saudi Arabia. Um, this year gives a little bit of a cushion and a window. Um, CapEx across the board in Saudi Arabia is down, but there is continued interest and in government priority of you know, some of these mega projects. Um, but it's also a really good time for broader infrastructure investment especially into transport. You know, many of the new sites in Saudi Arabia are in places that people have not really visited or lived in before. They're more isolated. So getting that kind of transport infrastructure in place is really a priority. Getting the service sector um, in place, particularly in places where people are going to want to travel, where they can be more independent, hiking, walking out in nature, not close to other people. Um, but you have to set the groundwork for that. So this year and next year, when things are more quiet, might be a good time to, to build that capacity up. The other good news is that we have a lot of demand now for new financial products that focus on the environment, on, um, on you know, kind of ESG governance, on um, kind of the, the society at large. And so investors are very interested in the kind of infrastructure products and projects um, that have a good social value, um, as particularly in green finance. So we can approach a market and say, hey, look, we want to run this, you know, this new light rail line or electric rail line or solar powered hotel um, in an area that doesn't have a lot of tourism impact yet. We want to grow it. Um, and it's in a way that is both environmentally friendly, uh, creates jobs and has a good um, kind of social impact. Um, so that's a silver lining also of this moment for the Gulf, um, which I think investors will be very interested in. Um, agriculture is another priority. And if you look at some of the work, which really predates the COVID crisis that um, the IFC has been doing, that the UNWTO has been doing, um, is around these kinds of projects and the financing of these kinds of projects. Um, so that's a policy tool that is relatively new, that fits very nicely into the kind of um, crisis and remediation efforts that we need right now. Um, you know, anything that focuses on biodiversity, cultural heritage, these are things that the tourist market is interested in, and these are things that investors are interested in funding. Um, so that fits nicely into some of the kind of ongoing tourism goals, particularly in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, but across the Gulf at large. Um, some of the problem areas, though, are ones that are shared across Europe and other regions. We're seeing a lot of weakness, of course, in the aviation sector. Um, for Gulf state-owned airlines, this is a big problem. Um, and we are seeing tremendous job cuts um, and consolidation in these industries. Um, there will be opportunities, perhaps, for mergers, um, for creating more of the kind of budget airline travel, um, really kind of stratifying where that customer is. If it's not the business traveler, which accounts for 35, 40% of most airline revenue, then you have to cater to a different kind of travel market. And I think we're going to see that um, happening throughout the aviation sector and the, the government um, support for that sector in the Gulf. Um, we're also seeing a, a probably opportunities for distressed investment um, in real estate, in the hotel sector. Um, this isn't all bad, right? Again, we can see consolidation, we can see catering to a different kind of tourist market. And I would just highlight, you know, the big news across the Gulf now is in, you know, normalization of ties with Israel between the UAE and Bahrain. And this creates an opportunity for um, religious tourism that is much broader in scope, so that you might get a tourist who is interested in going to the Vatican, going to Jerusalem, and then going to the Arabian Peninsula, and really getting a larger picture of that Abrahamic tradition. So I think there are marketing opportunities, there are government initiatives, we can be in partnership with other governments and other countries, other regions, um, which are hopeful for the return of, of this important industry um, to the Gulf over the next two, three years. So th thank you, Dr. Young. Um, 
so um, so we didn't have much time left. I would just um, would like to, to remind uh, our audience uh, if if you have uh, any question, um, feel free please to uh, to share the question uh, in the Q and A um, uh, in in the in, in Zoom function and uh, writing question, and then we will read it to to the panelists. Um, so let's conclude with a very a quick round of, of uh, remarks on uh, the, the, the prospect of co cooperation between the two regions uh, regarding the sector. So let's start with, uh, uh, um, with uh, Mr. Blue. If you would give us in, in, in two minutes, uh, how do you see uh, the grounds for cooperation uh, between Europe and, and the Gulf. Thank you very much. Um, uh, as uh, Professor Young mentioned, I think we see this as a valuable opportunity to upscale our foundations, whether it be infrastructure, investments in development and what have you. And I think the kingdom, even though that we've been no stranger to tourism, as we've been hosting visitors from across the world for 1,400 years into Mecca and Medina, uh, albeit this type of tourism might be something that we need to accelerate our growth in. And that expertise is needed uh, for us to reach uh, a global standard and a quality that we are uh, uh, definitely targeting, whether they be in the attraction of destination management companies and tour operators to come and have activities on the ground in the kingdom, whether it be uh, hotel operators, specialized operators for attractions and hospitality alike, or whether even they may be in the areas of entertainment her and heritage and what have you. We have 10,000 heritage sites across the kingdom that, are, as Professor Young mentioned, some are more accessible than others. But the idea is really to create a synergy in terms of uh, connectivity between them so that a, a visitor coming to the shores of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia really manages to come out of it with a truly Arabian experience. And that's the identity and that's the authenticity. And if you were going to take something away from this call, it would be in, 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 in you know, the, the most primary uh, 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 attribute is we are staying authentic to our Arabian experience and promising the Arabian experience at its fullest. Uh, uh, so in terms of, uh, uh, you know, areas of collaboration, we are looking for expertise. We believe that there are plenty of investment opportunities in the kingdom. We believe there is plenty of room for specialized operators, experts in this field. And we are very optimistic about not just our recovery, but even our 2030 ambitions. If I just want to share with you very quickly some stats from our TENEFAS program, which is our domestic tourism campaign this year, we uh, managed to reach two and a half billion impressions from our market marketing campaigns. And that is simply by marketing the, the destinations that Professor Young was mentioning, the 10,000 heritage sites across the kingdom. We uh, uh, managed to get uh, uh, more than 10,700 marketing material out there for people to become more aware about what the kingdom has to offer. And awareness is definitely something that we need to improve as a country, let alone as in tourism. Uh, and the establishment of the Saudi Tourism Authority will take us a long way to that. Just finally, in terms of uh, private sector contribution, I mentioned earlier a statistic that is of paramount importance. 35% of all offering offered during this domestic tourism campaign came from brand new investment, new private ventures. And that is definitely an indicator that uh, uh, for us keeps us optimistic. Uh, uh, and we are very, very welcoming. And I extend the invitation for all of you to come and visit the kingdom and see for yourselves the amazing uh, 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 offering that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blewett. So very, very quickly, uh, if uh, uh, Ms. Um, Motirani, if, if you could uh, also share your thoughts about uh, areas of cooperation uh, between the two regions regarding the challenges uh, facing, facing the sixth. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, obviously there are various areas of cooperation from one side, the, the fact that the Mediterranean area in general has uh, 
such an important common ground in terms of uh, uh, culture and in terms of uh, cultural identities. So as there's a, a growing relevance of uh, these aspects in tourism demand, I think we have the opportunity to see tourism as a sort of passport for peace along those countries so we can improve all the uh, social and cultural connections that are related uh, to tourism activities. This goes along with, uh, with investments, so uh, obviously uh, what, what Karen Young and what uh, uh, Mr. Abelawi were underlying uh, uh, the space we have to to invest in new forms of of tourism and in new types of investments is uh, very relevant nowadays. But uh, if we considering if we consider traveling along the countries um, in the in the uh, short medium term when travel restrictions were uh, will uh, will uh, easier, uh, I think that uh, we we need also to work on some concrete aspects that can allow people uh, moving in a somehow new situation so um, we need to we need obviously to to simplify rules and to simplify um, all the all the aspects that can limit tourism demand I'm thinking about visa restrictions I'm thinking about uh, I don't know, traveler taxes or reinforcing traveler rights along countries. Because one aspect we saw also in Europe, where, you know, Europe is a big region with a lot in common, but at the same time is a region made of different countries, is that one, one point uh, that somehow has not worked that well uh, over the um, over the post lockdown phase was the fact that border restrictions and uh, rules for travelers uh, were not aligned were not coordinated uh, so i think that also from this respect which is uh, softer than uh, investments we really need to work in order to allow a free movement of people along those countries Thank you very much. So let's, um, so we don't have much time for discussion. Let's um, save the time for, for the Q&A. But maybe before we move to the, the Q&A, um, um, uh, Ms. Al-Mayman, Al if, if, you, if you could just leave us with um, general impression or uh, ex your expectations of, of this prospect of the sector in, in the short and, and the long term in in the, in the in both regions or or even even uh, globally yes uh thank you ahmed uh well generally speaking um uh, as uh, professor young was saying um uh, some countries, um, rather some destinations, would need to diversify their products and services. We definitely need uh, more marketing activities. Um, also for um, a better socio and economic uh, recovery, uh, there has to be uh, more international cooperation and uh, responsibilities and um, uh, and, a, uh, and a good leadership uh, to handle this uh, crisis. Um, also, um, there has to be also a responsible um, relationship between the tourism industry and tourists. Um, hotels need to, need to ease their um, cancellation policies, um, and, um, and reservation policies. It's, it's, a, it's a mutual responsibility between the consumer and, uh, and the industry. If you allow me to, to, to read some quotes by the UN uh, Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres on restarting tourism. So um, let us ensure tourism regains its position as a provider of decent jobs, stable incomes, and the protection of our cultural and natural uh, heritage. This is something that the Secretary General said uh, when he launched his policy uh, brief on COVID-19 and tourism. 
Also, it's imperative that we rebuild the tourism sector, but it is a must in a way that it's safe, equitable, and climate friendly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, um, so let's now open the floor for the questions. So I will read, I will try to, to pick some questions. Uh, I hope we can cover as much as, as, as we could. So maybe starting with, um, with Amir Qayyum. Um, so he's, he, he's a, as an investor in the Middle East and outside, for us, we need smooth movement of tourists. So and in, in another longer comment, he expressed uh, some frustration uh, as an investor in the sector from, from um, uh, the restrictions uh, needed for, um, for managing the public health crisis. So uh, the, the question would be, uh, I mean, expressing that, uh, that frustration, um, on, on the micro level, how much of um, the actors, the businesses, the small, medium and, the, and, and small businesses in the tourism industries are capable financially to withstand uh, this crisis and the financial strain caused by this crisis? So maybe um, we can ask the question uh, to Mr. Megili. Yeah, I hope I understood your question well. You were relating to the SMEs, right? Yes. Yes. Um, you know, SMEs uh, is probably the biggest issue of all uh, we're facing uh, these days, because uh, I'm sure you would all agree, uh, depending on the on the market, but. SMEs in tourism account for probably 80 to 90 percent of all enterprises. So it's a, it's a massive, uh, massive industry within the industry, and it's the backbone of the industry with many independent uh, companies, with many companies which are uh, fundamentally below five employees. So you know uh, all DMCs, uh, um, you know small guides companies, and so on which are actually delivering the experience to, to all of us as travelers. And um, uh, here, I think it, it's very, very important um, that, that, that the relevant financial and, and funding measures are in place. And uh, that's, I think, why a lot of governments have pushed so aggressively on securing the season. Um, so here it was the summer season, which is in the Middle East, uh, the, the, the off-peak season, but here it's uh, one of the main seasons, simply because they knew that if, um, if uh, there is no traffic uh, coming into, into these SME uh, regions, then uh, they will suffer heavily uh, from this until kind of the next season, uh, next season starts. So um, we did a lot of projections on that, uh, including the funding needs, um, but uh, it's, it's a huge, huge issue, particularly also related to one of the, the core challenging elements in tourism, which is uh, job attrition, right? Uh, the, the tourism industry is not the industry where people stay long in their jobs. It's not the industry where you have, you know, the, the biggest career options, and it's certainly not the industry where you have the highest uh, salaries paid. Uh, on top, you have part-time workers, you have seasonal workers, you have a high share of, of female uh, workers also in there. So, uh, you know, quite a difficult industry. And if we lose the SMEs or part of the SMEs, we lose a lot of jobs. And these jobs are not to be recovered simply because they go to other sectors earn more, have a better life, and certainly don't come back to this industry. Thank you very much. Um, so here is another question uh, from uh, Simona. Um, good, good afternoon. What, what do you think about the future tourism rules with or without COVID situation? Um, so maybe um, if we understood the question, the question is about the rules of, of the tourism and, and how maybe COVID, um, I mean, um, how, how COVID 
would change the role of uh, of the industry. Um, so if if um, Miss uh, Mutironi, if if you could handle that questions. Uh, I, I'm not really sure I got the question. Um, if I got it right, is uh, about the future of the sector for the COVID situation. Is it is it that question? Pardon. If you yes. allow me, I think it's in reference to the regulations, perhaps, to government regulations and, and on tourism. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, with regard to government regulations, obviously uh, they are being a very important aspect for, uh, for the present and the next future of tourism considering the pandemic. Uh, I was saying that, uh, uh, for instance, uh, we really need uh, certain rules about uh, movement of people about, uh, for instance, um, the the uh, rules we have when we travel abroad, when we uh, when we return home, and we need to have clear rules about uh, protocols and health uh, measures that we uh, that we find in different countries. And this is something uh, that can impact in an important way the, the the next future of tourism because consumers need to be confident. So when they travel and if we want to sustain the uh, the 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 demand for traveling, uh, this is a very important point. So from this uh, respect, I think we have a, a situation where government rules are becoming uh, very relevant uh, also in consumer choices because uh, they have an impact in the in the willingness of traveling to a country or not and in the uh, let's say confidence people may have in traveling um, so uh, from from this respect uh, i i expect the role of governments uh, uh, in this being uh, very relevant uh, at the moment uh, thank you very much um, so if um, so, I think that that this is the time that we have for for the questions. Um, we'll move on to uh, the the final uh, remarks uh, remark by uh, uh, His Ex Excellency, uh, Mr. Mr. Thank you, Hakmed. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Um, Allow me, first of all, uh, to thank uh, all uh, the panelists and uh, the participants for their insightful analysis and interesting contribution. Uh, it's not uh, my intention to try to summarize such a rich uh, discussion, uh, but I believe that uh, there are three main points that we can take away from, uh, from this seminar. Uh, first of all, it's clear to everybody that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused uh, unprecedented challenges to our economic, social, and cultural system. This has been particularly evident uh, in the tourist sector, where the pandemic has highlighted the paramount importance uh, to keep travelers uh, and tourists safe especially at the time when international mobility was deeply and suddenly affected and many of our nationals found themselves stranded abroad. Second, as we work on the post-COVID recovery and adjust our behaviors and lifestyles to this new reality, tourism remains a major driver for global economic growth and the sustainable and inclusive socioeconomic economic This is especially true for countries like Italy, where tourism accounts for 13% of our GDP and 15% of our workforce. And it's also true for countries 
like the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, was chosen to make tourism one of the main pillars of economic diversification and job creation under Vision 2030. Uh, the third aspect uh, is that tourism is important not only because it creates jobs, opportunities, and contributes to economic growth, but because it allows people to connect, to discover new cultures and traditions, to appreciate and value cultural heritage, and to overcome stereotypes and prejudices. It is not by coincidence that Italy is one of the most visited countries in the world. Tourists come to Italy because they like our food, our music and theatres, the beauty of our environment, but also to enjoy one of the 55 UNESCO World Heritage Sites that Italy proudly holds. Um, as some of the panelists have pointed out, these issues are therefore right at the top of the international agenda and concerns. Most recently, they have been discussed by the ministers of tourism of the G20 during the ministerial meeting, which was held last week under the presidency of Saudi Arabia. In the run up to the Italian presidency next year, and as a member of the Troika, over the course of this year, Italy has worked closely with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to ensure a united and strong response of the international community to the consequences of the global pandemic. We look forward to take over from the excellent work done by Saudi presidency and move closer towards our common objectives and priorities the protection of the people, especially the most vulnerable, a resilient and prosperous economy, and the protection of the environment. This is why people, planet, and prosperity are the key three priorities of the Italian G20 president. Uh, before concluding, allow me uh, one final remark. Uh, to congratulate and thanks once again our host from ISPI and the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies. These two distinguished institutions are both co-hosts of the G20 track within our respective G20 presidency. But as Ambassador of Italy to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, I'm particularly glad to see this fruitful cooperation continue between the two leading Italian and Saudi think tanks. Also within the framework of the Rome Med Mediterranean Dialogue Conference organized annually under the auspices of the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. As you know, uh, this year's Rome Med uh, will take place uh, has uh, it has been already um, remember underlined from the uh, um, 25th of November to the 4th of December in a hybrid format, mainly through vir virtual session and panel discussion. Uh, because of the constraints of the pandemic, we will not be able to welcome you all in Rome, but like every year, we promise to offer you an outstanding program and debates, analysis and dialogues on a much bigger virtual platform, and always with participation of the key political, economic, social, and cultural actors of the wider Mediterranean region. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency. Um, I, I would like we here to come to the end of the, uh, the event. I would like to thank um, uh, our panelists for their time and, and insights. Uh, also, I would like to thank uh, our partner uh, ISPI uh, for, for organizing uh, this event. And of course, thank you, thanks to, to all of, uh, of those who, uh, who joined us uh, 
for in, in this webinar. Um, so thank you all and I hope you have a good day.